It's May 1940. Western Europe stands on the brink of a tumultuous chapter. Still bearing the scars of its World War I defeat, Germany sets its sights on France, looking for vengeance. This time the Germans would not make the same mistake as in the previous war. Gone are the days of static trench warfare. The Germans are about to present a new strategy that involves swift thrusts of concentrated tank units, aiming to surprise, encircle, and crush the enemy. Indeed, within just a week, the German panzer units were making rapid advances through the lowlands in northern France. The French high command, caught off guard, scrambles to respond. On the front lines, confusion and fear grip French soldiers. Yet among all the German units, one stands out for its relentless pace and unpredictability. The 7th Panzer Division, their 25th Tank Battalion, advancing quickly and unpredictably, earned a ghostly moniker. Reports flood in, but no one can predict where this ghost division will strike next. Leading this ghost division in the early morning hours on May 10th, 1940, was an inexperienced commander in Germany's new Blitzkrieg operations. His exploits became legendary in the annals of World War II as the Desert Fox. He would first prove his prowess on the battlefield against a superior enemy in both numbers and equipment in what some called the greatest battle of annihilation of all time. His name was Erwin Rommel, and this is the story of his Ghost Division. The story of the 7th Panzer started in the Thuringia region in November 1938 with the formation of the 2nd Light Division. The creation was prompted by the fear of the German Army's cavalry arm of Panzer units intrusion in their scouting and screening roles. The division's mandate was clear, to provide mobility with modest armored protection. Composed of the 6th and 7th mechanized cavalry regiments, the division was supplemented with one reconnaissance regiment, one panzer battalion, one artillery regiment, an engineer battalion, and an anti-tank battalion. Its limited armor assets included the Panzer I training tank and the Panzer II interim production tank, small, lightly armed, and armored vehicles. The division's baptism by fire came during the invasion of Poland in 1939 as part of the German 10th Army. After the war, the division returned to Germany, where its limited role was put for evaluation. As a result, on October 18, 1939, the unit was transformed into the 7th Panzer Division, ushering in a new era in mechanized warfare. Perhaps the more important moment in the unit's history was the assignment of its first commander, General Major Erwin Rommel, an officer who would become one of the most iconic figures of World War II. A man whose rise through the ranks was as swift as it was unconventional. Rommel's journey to becoming the commander of the famed Ghost Division was marked by a series of remarkable twists of fate. Before the outbreak of World War II, Rommel had no experience commanding a division, nor had he been directly involved in the new Blitzkrieg tactics. In fact, during the invasion of Poland, he had not commanded any combat units. Instead, his military career had taken a rather unconventional path. Rommel's ascent to prominence can be attributed in large part to his personal connection with Adolf Hitler. Their first encounter was a brief one at a Reichsbarentag, a traditional fair-turned political event. This encounter also introduced Rommel to Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister, who would become one of his patrons. In the years leading up to World War II, acquaintances with leading Nazis recommended Rommel for various positions, including serving as a liaison officer to the Hitler Youth and Commandant of the Theresian Military Academy at Wiener Neustadt. Then, in October 1938, Hitler personally requested Rommel to command his escort battalion, the Führerbegleit Bataillon, during key territorial acquisitions, including the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, and Memel. Rommel's rapid promotion culminated in his appointment as a major general, and his close proximity to Hitler during the Polish campaign provided invaluable insights into the evolving tactics of the German military. Rommel's ability to adapt and excel in these diverse roles paved the way for his command of one of Germany's prized panzer divisions, the 7th Panzer Division. This decision raised eyebrows among senior military figures as Rommel's rise to prominence defied convention. Nevertheless, his appointment as a major general in command of a panzer division marked a turning point in his career 
and set the stage for his legendary role in the forthcoming campaign in the West. According to Field Marshal Erich von Meinstein's plan for the Battle of France, the so-called Case Yellow 15th Panzer Corps comprising the 5th Panzer and Rommel's 7th Panzer were the only Panzer units within Group Army A. This army group was envisioned as the main striking force to breach through the Ardennes Mountains and in the rear of the Allied troops in the Lowlands. The success of the plan depended entirely on how quickly it was implemented. In this regard, the Panzer Division and its role were fundamental. Rommel's approach to his task was characterized by relentless determination and a keen understanding of the value of time. He knew that there existed a narrow window a mere three to four days to cross the formidable Meuse River. Failure to achieve this could jeopardize the entire offensive. To expedite his advance, Rommel relied on the motorcycle and armored reconnaissance units of the 25th Panzer Battalion within his division. These agile and fast-moving units covered vast distances more swiftly than others and possessed the firepower necessary to clear obstacles and deal with resistance. The initial day of the offensive witnessed remarkable progress. The division traversed the River Orta and advanced an astonishing 90 kilometers in a single day, surging ahead at a pace that outstripped neighboring units. The 5th Panzer Division to the north and the 23rd Infantry Division to the south Communication was sporadic at best. With the Meuse River now a mere 35 kilometers away, Rommel displayed an unwavering commitment to minimize rest and maintain momentum. He led from the front with his forward units pressing forward and holding close contact with the reconnaissance elements. The first real encounter with substantial resistance occurred at Dinan, as Rommel's forces clashed with a formidable French contingent. Despite the challenges, by the afternoon of May 12th, his division had astonishingly reached the mighty Meuse River. Rommel achieved this remarkable progress with the support of his superior, General Hermann Hoth, who endorsed the concept of aggressive tank spearheads. Taking calculated risks was a necessity. While Rommel had reached the Meuse River in record time, the formidable obstacle that lay before him demanded crossing. The need for an intact bridge across the formidable Meuse River was paramount for Rommel and his 7th Panzer Division. The Meuse presented a formidable obstacle with its deep wide waters and steep rugged banks. Additionally, the French had successfully demolished key bridges ahead of the advancing 15th Corps, including those at Ou, Dinan, and Bouvigny. To further complicate the challenges, the French reinforced their defenses with the arrival of the 2nd Battalion of the 39th Regiment. 5th Motorized Division, to a hill near Hu. Nevertheless, the situation for the Allies was far from secure. Morale in this sector was already showing signs of wavering. They had anticipated having five days to reinforce and organize their defenses in case of a German attack through the Ardennes. But Rommel was there in two. Rommel arrived at the Meuse in an armored car, surveyed the well-defended far bank with field glasses, and concluded that infantry would be required for the crossing. His motorized infantry swiftly moved into position, and by the time the sun set on May 12th, had established firm control of the east bank of the Meuse between Dinan and Ou. In the early hours of the following morning, the German offensive commenced. The western bank of the Meuse, opposite the advancing Germans, was held by two French infantry divisions, the 18th and 22nd, which were still arriving after a long foot march. The soldiers of Rommel's 7th Motorized Infantry Regiment began crossing the Meuse at Dinant, while infantry from his 6th Regiment crossed between Leffe and Hou. The dam and lock at Hou had not been destroyed by either the Belgians or the French, as they feared it would lower the river level and potentially make it fordable in some spots. This oversight proved fortuitous for the Germans though it exposed a critical gap in responsibility between the French II Corps and the Huitgetunt Corps. The crossing on the morning of May 13th primarily utilized inflated rubber boats. French machine guns and well-concealed artillery inflicted heavy casualties on the German infantry. Facing this challenge, Rommel ordered the houses in the Meuse Valley set on fire to generate the smoke needed to obscure the crossing. The attack at Hoe was also aided by the fact that the French 18th Infantry was still arriving, and only a portion had reached the Meuse. The units that were in position were exhausted from a forced march. 
Furthermore, poor communication among French commanders delayed their response to the German bridgehead at Ou. On the critical day of May 13th, the 18th Division made no serious attempt to drive the Germans back. By the end of the day, the Germans had formed two bridgeheads. At Dinan, the 7th Regiment encountered a temporary halt as the crossing equipment had been destroyed by enemy fire. Tanks and artillery eventually arrived, suppressing the enemy fire and enabling additional troop crossings. Rommel personally led the 2nd Battalion across the river, where they joined the units already on the opposite bank. In contrast to the French response, Rommel's proactive approach prioritized rapid action. He ordered his infantry to continue the crossings, employing pontoons and cable ferries. At Leffe, engineers built a pontoon bridge to serve as the main supply line for the Panzer Corps. Throughout the night, tanks were ferried across, and by morning, 30 Panzers had made the journey. Surprisingly, the French response was sluggish despite having ample mobile forces at their disposal. The French lacked coordination and failed to mount a potent counterattack, allowing the Germans to consolidate their bridgehead. On the morning of May 14th, the 7th Motorized Infantry Regiment's advance guard rapidly pushed forward and reached the town of Onhaya, west of Dinant. However, a misunderstanding led to a temporary crisis when Colonel Georg von Bismarck's message of arrived was mistakenly interpreted as encircled. This miscommunication triggered a flurry of activity, diverting units to assist. The situation was eventually resolved, but it began showing the first signs of communication challenges on the battlefield. As the 7th Panzer Division advanced relentlessly through the French countryside, it encountered a formidable adversary on May 15, 1940, the 1st Armored Division of the French Army, General André Georg Korap, commander of the French 9th Army. In a desperate attempt to stop the German advance, he called upon this powerful armored force to restore the situation along the Meuse. However, a series of delays and misjudgments hampered the French response. It wasn't until the night of May 13th that the Supreme Command released the division to General Korab's 9th Army, ordering it to prepare for a counterattack towards Dinan. However, typical of the French bureaucracy, Korab failed to commit the division promptly, allowing it to idle on standby for the entire morning of May 14th, while Rommel's 7th Panzer Division continued to overwhelm French resistance at Onhai and Hotlo Wastia. Finally, at 2 p.m., the 1st Armored Division received its execution order, yet it took another five hours to cover a mere 35 kilometers to reach the area north of Flavion. By this time, Rommel's division had already reached Morville, a location only four kilometers northwest of Flavion, unknowingly closing in on the French tanks. The inefficiency of the French refueling process further handicapped the division. Rather than utilizing the German practice of distributing fuel via jerry cans at designated stations, the French relied on special trucks with limited cross-country capabilities, significantly delaying the process. Consequently, when Rommel's panzers encountered the French tanks, many were still refueling, making them vulnerable. In a sharp engagement, the German panzers exploited this vulnerability, targeting the heavier and more powerful French Char B-1 and Samoa S-35 tanks from the sides, as their guns lacked the power to penetrate their frontal armor. The French tanks' rapid fuel consumption and lack of radios further disadvantaged them. Stuka dive bombers joined the fray, further devastating the French tanks. As a result, by the evening of May 15th, the 1st Armored Division had suffered massive losses, with only a fraction of their tanks remaining operational. The ineffectual French response allowed Rommel's 7th Panzer Division to create a substantial breach at Dinant. By the end of May 15th, Rommel had advanced to Serfontaine, nearly 50 kilometers west of the Meuse, and opened a gap in the French defenses that had dire implications for the entire Western campaign. Korap's decision to abandon the Meuse defense line without adequately reinforcing it led to the rapid disintegration of the French 9th Army, allowing Rommel's panzers to surge ahead. As Rommel continued his relentless advance, clashes with French infantry and tanks became common. His emphasis on speed and independent thinking among his officers enabled him to outmaneuver the disorganized French forces. In the face of mounting French surrenders, 
the breakdown of order and cohesion in the French army became increasingly evident. Rommel's determination to push the boundaries continued as he approached the so-called extended Maginot Line along the French-Belgian frontier. While this line of fortifications was less formidable than the true Maginot Line further east, it still presented a significant challenge. Yet, Rommel was undeterred. However, on the morning of May 16th, Rommel received unexpected orders to remain in his headquarters until 9.30 a.m. The reason for this delay was an order from Army Group A that its lead elements were not to cross the extended Maginot Line, reflecting the anxiety about the unprotected flanks of the Panzer thrusts. When General Hans Gunther von Kluge, the commander of the 4th Army, visited Rommel's headquarters that day, Rommel presented him with plans that deviated from the orders of Army Group A Kluge, authorized a limited push west with the Panzers. Rommel received preliminary orders to punch through the Maginot Line and attack Avenez. A few hours later, the written order restricting the advance reached Rommel's HQ. By that time, he had already set his Panzers in motion. Curiously, Rommel seemed to lose radio contact with his superiors for an extended period. Whether this was due to a real breakdown in communication, or a calculated move on Rommel's part to avoid further orders, it allowed him to proceed with his daring plan. What followed was one of the most astonishing and decisive advances in military history. As Rommel's 7th Panzer Division crossed the French border, they encountered concrete bunkers, minefields, and barbed wire. Any other general might have hesitated, but Rommel saw this as an opportunity for a surprise attack. The assault on the Maginot Line at twilight, with no preparation, was unprecedented. The surprise was total, and Rommel's unorthodox attacking tactics with all guns firing worked magnificently. The French were bewildered and unable to respond effectively. Rommel's audacity led him to continue the advance, pushing through the second line of French fortifications. His unit had advanced nearly 80 kilometers since the previous morning, creating chaos in the French rear. The French command was utterly puzzled by the situation as it seemed Rommel's unit appeared from nowhere in the most unexpected place. They started calling his unit La Division Fantôme, the Ghost Division. Interestingly, neither did the German command know more about Rommel's whereabouts. However, Rommel soon realized that his rear detachments were lagging, making the situation precarious. Leaving the main body of his unit in a hedgehog defense formation, Rommel decided to go back to find the rest of his division. He rushed back along the same road he came in his armored signal vehicle, with only one Panzer III tank as an escort, which soon broke down. As he moved down the road, he stumbled upon a column of French trucks retreating westwards. An unbelievable scene followed. Standing atop his signal vehicle in his general's uniform, Rommel stopped the column. The French officer leading the column stepped out of his vehicle and offered his surrender. Showing no signs of distress, Rommel led the column of captives toward Avesne, where he found his infantry battalion. The column he single-handedly captured counted 40 vehicles, all filled with armed soldiers, some of them manning heavy machine guns. Rommel's spectacular seven-day march ultimately resulted in the capture of 10,000 prisoners, 100 tanks, 30 armored cars, and 27 guns. Many more lay down their arms to the advancing German troops. Rommel's belief in the shock and surprise of his panzer assault had paid off, and the 7th Panzer Division had created chaos in the heart of enemy territory at the cost of only 35 men killed and 59 wounded. On May 18th, Rommel received orders to continue to push forward. Although the Panzer Regiment was not yet ready to move, Rommel refused to wait. He organized a composite battle group primarily consisting of motorized infantry supported by a few tanks and self-propelled flak guns. By creating the illusion of a major armored assault, throwing up dust and firing sporadically, the group captured Cambrai by nightfall. The 19th was a day for regrouping and allowing the exhausted Panzer crews to rest. However, Rommel insisted on launching another night attack to seize the high ground south of Arras. In the early morning darkness of May 20th, the Panzers, with Rommel in the lead as usual, set out once more. This time, French cavalry tanks infiltrated German lines of communication and threw Rommel in danger of being surrounded. 
Throughout the remainder of the day, he was engaged in clearing up the situation with the help of artillery. Despite rumors of British and French divisions concentrating near Arras, Rommel dismissed them and advanced toward the town. Meanwhile, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Division reached the English Channel at noyelle sur mer around 8 p.m., splitting the Allies in two with a narrow Panzer corridor. Approximately 250,000 British and French troops were cut off from their supply bases. Winston Churchill, Britain's Prime Minister, recognizing that the German Panzers were far from their main body of troops, urged a breakout to the southwest of Arras. Rommel, however, was reluctant to back away. He ordered the 25th Panzer Regiment to advance northwest of Arras, targeting Lille via Acu. Rommel encountered chaos as British tanks attacked the exposed flank of German infantry near Fischot. Despite the dire situation, he rallied gun crews and deployed every available weapon to halt the enemy. The 88mm high-velocity flak guns particularly proved effective against British tanks. During the Battle of Arras, Rommel was, as usual, in the center of the action. He even faced death as a British tank cornered his vehicle at one moment. However, instead of eliminating the German general, the British tank commander decided to surrender. Ultimately, the uncoordinated nature of the British attack and lack of support favored the Germans, who forced the British to flee the battlefield. The 25th Panzer Regiment was redirected to cut off the British retreat, but it encountered French tanks, leading to a bitter fight with significant losses. The Battle of Arras, though a tactical defeat for the British, alarmed the German high command, notably Hitler, who feared another flank attack could have far-reaching consequences for the campaign. In the days following the battle, Rommel continued pushing north, helping secure the position around Lille. On June 1st, his troops were relieved by infantrymen. The following day, he was summoned to see Hitler in Berlin, who wanted to congratulate him on his marvelous achievement. During the meeting, Hitler told him they were all worried for him during the attack. Throughout the rest of the campaign, the 7th Panzer enjoyed what Rommel described as a pleasant lightning tour of France, since the French showed almost no resistance after they lost most of their troops and equipment. When the armistice was signed, Rommel and his men were within 120 miles of the Spanish border. During the campaign, at the cost of 2,610 men and 42 tanks lost, Ghost Division captured 97,648 prisoners, 277 field guns, 64 anti-tank guns, 458 tanks and armored cars, and more than 4,000 trucks. The legend of Erwin Rommel and his elusive Ghost Division is a remarkable tale of audacity, innovation, and military prowess during the early days of World War II. Throughout the campaign in France, they pushed past the Meuse in a contested river crossing, overran and destroyed enemy divisions, taking tens of thousands of prisoners and a vast amount of equipment. Rommel's audacious approach often pushed the boundaries of orders, bordering on full disregard to them that would usually get a soldier to court-martial. His extraordinary successes against a superior enemy in both numbers and equipment instead earned him the highest recognition in the Wehrmacht, the Knight's Cross. Rommel's legacy extends beyond his early victories in France. His subsequent role as the commander of the Africa Corps in North Africa solidified his reputation as the Desert Fox, further illustrating his remarkable career in World War II. Thank you for watching this episode. Please subscribe to the Militology channel for more content, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos. Stay tuned.